that last sentence on Aristotle is significantly left out. <laughs> I can't believe it. Thus, the English-speaking members of the Austrian School of Eco Economics, who view Newt Wicksell as one of their own, are denied the full benefit of his work and thought. Can you believe that? The banker and economist who's a part of the, of the group of modern economists wrote a book and the editors, who were probably influenced by what? A banker? <laughs> Took out the one line that they didn't want to see in his book, that he wanted in the book. And again, that line was, it is not true that money is only one form of capital, that the lending of money constitutes the lending of real capital in the form of money. He says, money does not enter into the process of production. It is in itself, as Aristotle showed, quite sterile, unquote. So that's it. And so to, you know, to, to sum up, the, the banks don't want us to think about Aristotle and what Aristotle has to say about money. Because Aristotle was connected to the, um, the ancient world. And the ancient world had those... Um, you know, spiritual and religious origins. And those spiritual and religious origins go all the way back to when we were primates still in Africa, running around eating mushrooms and working on the golden rule, helping each other out. And so that, that's where we come from. As humans, we come from a place of cooperation and care and love and caring about each other. <laughs> that's who we are. And we've, somehow been duped and let a small group of people divide and conquer us using the banking system that we, we created for ourselves to make sure we had a surplus. Well, the bankers, they have hoarded that surplus. And when you see a billionaire out there who has a billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars, that's just as bad. They are taking the money that we, let's imagine all the money in the world is the money on a Monopoly game board, and the Monopoly game board is the world. Well, if you've ever played Monopoly, you know, the losers run out of money and the winner takes all the money. That's why Monopoly, you know, it, it's, uh, well, it can be exciting, you know, that's why it's exciting, and that's also why I, you know, have have a problem with monopoly because you know everybody who loses loses because they don't have any money it's like it, it, the game of monopoly goes against the golden rule 100 percent, and they that's why that game exists i believe and you can you can see why it's fun you know it's fun to succeed and have fun but nobody really wants to see somebody get hurt or starving or lose their house but the bankers do and they have for thousands of years and so Jesus, Buddha, Aristotle, great minds who have been connected to the ancient past have understood the golden rule. And that, that is where we come from as humans. So we got to stop, you know, being divided. We got to get back into the golden rule, treating each other how we want to be treated. That's the only way we're going to get out of this trouble that we have uh, created for ourselves. And this trouble is allowing people to steal all the resources, allowing a billionaire to have all of the money. Oh, I was going to say, they, the billionaire takes the money off of the game board of Monopoly, right? That's what they're doing. When you see somebody with $100 billion, that's $100 billion that was supposed to be in the money supply. You know, and so when they take that money out of the money supply and stash it, bury it in the ground or put it in a bank, they're not using that money in the, um, in, the, in the game of Monopoly anymore. So what happens? We have to print more money. And what, when we print, that's what the banks want us to do, right? Because when we print more money, we don't print the money ourselves, which we should do. Why don't we just print more money ourselves? No, what we do is we call up the Federal Reserve, which is not a government office, but a group of bankers that gave themselves a, 
a name that sounds like a government office. We call up that group of bankers and ask them if we can borrow money from them. And they say, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. We'll charge you a 5% interest or whatever. And then they don't print the money and give it to us. We print it for them. We, we print their money that they're charging interest on for ourselves. And we get even, it says even on the money, it's their money, Federal Reserve note. That Federal Reserve means it's the bank's money, not ours. So basically, we've been, we've been duped and lied to in, in so many different ways. You know, when people take money out of the game and become billionaires, that's not fair to the rest of us. That money is supposed to stay in the game so that we can use that money. That was all those billions of dollars represent blood, sweat, and tears that we have worked. Somebody, millions of people probably, worked millions of hours to generate a billion dollars. And then one guy invents a widget and everybody wants his widget. So, you know, he ends up getting all of those billions of hours, millions of hours of people's labor. You know, there's really nothing wrong with that as long as that money stays in the system. We don't have any legislation or rules that say you have to keep money in the system. And the only way to do that would be to have the opposite of a minimum wage. We need something, in my opinion, called a maximum wage. So that if you want to make more than $10 million, you know, you're going to have to pay 50% on that, or you're going to have to, you can have that money, but you have to, uh, you know, invest a large percent of it in, into uh, something that benefits everybody else. And uh, that gets us back to the golden rule, you know. This is, uh, this is something we're going to see happen soon. You know, in the next 50 years, I predict, we're going to have a climate problem so bad that we're going to see the truth that we uh, are presented in the movie Zeitgeist. There's a limited amount of resources. We have to figure out how to distribute those resources without hoarding them and without hurting each other. Well, the history of the banking industry, it's 25,000 years long, and it has a terrible history of hoarding, of hurting, of war, of starvation, and they divide and conquer us using propaganda and media to make sure that they stay in a position of power. It's the longest mental health um, problem that I know about. And uh, God, I believe, you know, has sent us people <laughs> to talk about it, like Jesus and Buddha and Aristotle, right? I mean, we have the brains to get out of this trouble, but we have to have the courage to do it. And the answer is not going to be violence. It is definitely not going to be violence. Because of the golden rule, the answer is going to be, we're going to have to treat these bankers how we want to be treated. And the trouble is, they don't care about that. So we have to figure out how to use the power of the larger group, the power of consensus over them. And that's why... You know, all, so many countries around the world look at the United States and wonder, how could, we, how could we have let it get so bad? How could we have failed? They know that we have the best opportunity in the world. We, you know, 250 years ago, they know, most other countries know, that the United States started something that was the best idea, the idea of democracy. And, and it is. And, but the, the trouble is, is that right away, the bankers, the hoarders and the money people tried to make sure that we didn't succeed too far with our idea of democracy. And it's getting to the point where we are today, where, you know, everybody's out for themselves. Fascism is looking like around the corner. And, um, you know, in, uh, big business is, is destroying the planet for us. We may not even get to live on this planet much longer if we don't solve this problem. And so, you know, we have an opportunity here, a real opportunity to use our democracy to take over 
the government, you know, remember the government is for the people. It's not an us versus them when we're talking about the U.S. government. What happened was the bankers used their money to get the people who are in government work to work for them. Well, we still have one thing left. The people have one thing left in their toolbox to solve, you know, solve the problem and to fix the day, and that is to vote. We still have the power to vote for the right people and get the vote out the wrong people. You know, like APAC, one of the biggest uh, political action committees, it's the uh, APAC is the uh, American Israeli Political Action Committee, basically, the PAC. And they're the second largest political action committee in the United States after, uh, you, know, you know, that group that's for 55 and older. <laughs> I have to get their name, but you know, they're too large. They're, they're, a, they represent another country entirely. They're not even a group that's within the United States. And they, APAC gives more money to more politicians in Congress than anybody else, which means that these politicians are now going to vote the way that some other country, Israel, wants them to vote. You know, and it's not right. Uh, you know, another idea here is that um, people complain that there's only two parties. Well, I thought, I used to think that there was only two parties, but then I learned that these, you know, the Democratic Party, for example, we had the power locally to take over our own Democratic office. And if we do that, then whatever political thoughts and philosophies we have is now going to be the policy of that democratic party that office well if we can take over our local office and then you know our neighbors take over their local office with the same political philosophy that we have which is i'm going to say the constitution right first second third fourth fifth amendment all the amendments let's keep them <laughs> anyway we have to take over the democratic or the republican parties they're there for that when people say we have a two-party system, that's not true. In the Democratic Party, we have 20 flavors, you know, and one of those flavors, uh, an Ayn Rand libertarian flavor, a Green Party climate change flavor, you know, real hippie, or, or you know, or usually a more uh, centrist Hillary Clinton style Democrat is what ends up taking over the local office. But if we do it, we can do it. The people, we can take over our local democratic office with our stronger policies and then start doing that in more offices around the country in different states. And then that's how we can change, you know, not only change the, uh, the idea of a two-party system, you know, we use the two-party system against, against them. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Everything that we have in government and in politics in the United States is perfectly set up for us to change how it is here. And that's why other countries, you know, third world countries especially, look to us as a place like they would like to go because they know our history too. It seems like we're the ones who have forgotten. And so... You know, we have an opportunity here. But anyway, I'm not going to talk too much more about that. You know, an hour is long enough. Um, thank you for coming. Don't forget to vote. Have a great day. Bye-bye.